episode 42. He doesn't look like trash, said Dill. He's not. He owns all one side of the riverbank down there, and he's from a real old family to boot. Then why does he do like that? That's just his way, said Jim. They say he never got over his wedding. He was supposed to marry one of the the Spencer ladies, I think. They were going to have a huge wedding, but they didn't. After the rehearsal, the bride went upstairs and blew her head off. Shotgun. She pulled the trigger with her toes. Did they ever know why? No, said Jim. Nobody ever knew quite why but Mr. Dolphus. They said it was because she found out about his colored woman. He reckoned he could keep her and get married too. He's been sort of drunk ever since. You know, though, he's real good to those chillin. Jim, I asked, what's a mixed child? Half white, half colored. You've seen him, Scout. You know that red-headed, kinky-headed one that delivers for the drugstore? He's half white. They're real sad. Sad? How come? I don't belong anywhere. Colored folks won't have them because they're half white. White folks won't have them because they're colored, so they're just in-betweens. Don't belong anywhere. But Mr. Dolphus now, they say he shipped two of his up north. They don't mind them up north. Yonder's one of them. A small boy clutching a Negro woman's hand walked toward us. He looked all Negro to me. He was rich chocolate with flaring nostrils and beautiful teeth. Sometimes he would skip happily, and the Negro woman tugged his hand to make him stop. Jim waited until they passed us. That's one of the little ones, he said. How can you tell, asked Dill. He looked black to me. You can't sometimes, not unless you know who they are. But he's half Raymond, all right. But how can you tell, I asked. I told you, Scout, you just have to know who they are. Well, how do you know we ain't Negroes? Uncle Jack Finch says we really don't know. He says as far as he can trace back to the Finches, we ain't. But for all he knows, we might have come straight out of Ethiopia during the Old Testament. Well, if we came out during the Old Testament, it's too long ago to matter. That's what I thought, said Jim. But around here, once you have a drop of Negro blood, that makes you all black. Hey, look. Some invisible signal had made the lunchers on the square rise and scatter bits of newspaper, cellophane, and wrapping paper. Children came to mothers, babies were cradled on hips, and men in sweat-stained hats collected their families and herded them through the courthouse doors. In a far corner of the square, the Negroes and Mr. Dolphus Raymond stood up and dusted their britches. There were few women and children among them, which seemed to dispel the holiday mood. They waited patiently at the doors behind the white families. Let's go in, said Dill. Now nah, we better wait till they get in. Atticus might not like it if he sees us, said Jim. The Maycomb County Courthouse was faintly reminiscent of Arlington in one respect. The concrete pillars supporting its south roof were too heavy for their light burden. The pillars were all that remained standing when the original courthouse burned in 1856. Another courthouse was built around them. It is better to say built in spite of them. But for the south porch, the Maycomb County Courthouse was early Victorian, presenting an unoffensive vista when seen from the north. From the other side, however, Greek Revival columns clashed with a big 19th century clock tower housing a rusty, unreliable instrument. A view indicating a people determined to preserve every physical scrap of the past. To reach the courtroom, on the second floor, one passed sundry, sunless county cubby holes. The tax assessor, the tax collector, the county clerk, the county solicitor, the circuit clerk, and the judge of probate 
lived in cool, dim hutches that smelled of decaying record books, mingled with old, damp cement and stale urine. It was necessary to turn on the lights in the daytime. There was always a film of dust on the rough floorboards. The inhabitants of these offices were creatures of their environment, little gray-faced men. They seemed untouched by wind or sun. We knew there was a crowd, but we had not bargained for the multitudes in the first-floor hallway. I got separated from Jem and Dill, but made my way toward the wall by the stairwell, knowing Jem would come for me eventually. I found myself in the middle of the Idlers Club and made myself as unobtrusive as possible. This was a group of white-shirted, khaki-trousered, suspendered old men who had spent their lives doing nothing and passed their twilight days doing same on pine benches under the live oaks on the square. Attentive critics of courthouse business, Atticus said they knew as much law as the Chief Justice from long years of observation. Normally, they were the court's only spectators, and today they seemed resentful of the interruption of their comfortable routine. When they spoke, their voices sounded casually important. The conversation was about my father, Thinks he knows what he's doing, one said. Oh, now I wouldn't say that, said another. Atticus Finch is a deep reader, a mighty deep reader. He reads all right, that's all he does, the club snickered. Let me tell you something now, Billy, a third said. You know the court appointed him to defend this nigger. Yeah, but Atticus aims to defend him. That's what I don't like about it. This was news, news that put a different light on things. Atticus had to, whether he wanted to or not. I thought it odd that he hadn't said anything to us about it. We could have used it many times in defending him and ourselves. He had to, that's why he was doing it. It equaled fewer fights and less fussing. But did that explain the town's attitude? The court appointed Atticus to defend him. Atticus aimed to defend him. And that's what they didn't like about it. It was confusing. The Negroes, having waited for the white people to go upstairs, began to come in now. Oh, now, just a minute, said a club member, holding up his walking stick. Just don't start up them there stairs yet a while. The club began its stiff, jointed climb and ran into Dill and Jem on their way down, looking for me. They squeezed past and Jem called out, Scott, come on, there ain't a seat left. We'll have to stand up. Look at there now, he said irritably as the black people surged upstairs. The old men ahead of them would take most of the standing room. We were out of luck and it was my fault, Jem informed me. We stood miserably by the wall. Can't y'all get in? Reverend Sykes was looking down at us, black hat in hand. Hey, Reverend, said Jem. Nah, Scout here messed us up. Well, let's see what we can do. Reverend Sykes edged his way upstairs. In a few moments, he was back. There's not a seat downstairs. Do y'all reckon it'd be all right if y'all came to the balcony with me? Gosh, yes, said Jem. Happily, we sped ahead of Reverend Sykes to the courtroom floor. There, we went up a covered staircase and waited at the door. Reverend Sykes came puffing behind us and steered us gently through the black people in the balcony. Four Negroes rose and gave us their front row seats. The colored balcony ran along three walls of the courtroom like a second-story veranda, and from it we could see everything. The jury sat to the left under long windows, sunburned, lanky. They seemed to be all farmers, but this was natural. Town folk rarely sat on juries. They were either struck or excused. One or two of the jury looked vaguely like dressed-up Cunninghams. At this stage, 
they sat straight and alert. 